Hello, everybody. This is Lauren Hershey. I'm the senior pastor at Word of Life Church, and we hope this podcast blesses you and helps bring you closer to God. Enjoy today's message. I do want to share the word with you this morning as we get ready to receive communion. Communion. If you don't have communion elements with you, would you raise your hand? The ushers will serve you so that when we get to that point, we can just roll right on into that. And again, if you're with us online, uh, go ahead and, and in your home, pull over in your car and stop, stop at Come and Go or Quick Stop, whatever, and get you some crackers and or bread and some juice, and let's celebrate communion together. And while the ushers are serving them, would you open your Bibles, if you haven't, to Matthew chapter 26. That's where we'll start today. Matthew chapter 26. Glory to God. Isn't it wonderful to know Jesus? Don't you wish everybody did? We want everybody to. And let's, uh, once again, I've studied, prayed, sought the Lord. I've got more notes, more pages of notes than I think I want to cover. So I, I want to say what the Lord would have, have me say to you for Him. Isn't that what we want? We want the anointed word. We want Christ speaking to our hearts. So can we pray and trust God together for that to happen? Hallelujah for each person. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. We do ask you for that utterance in the Holy Spirit. Thank you for speaking to my mind, speaking, speaking through my mouth, helping me think clearly and speak clearly. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you know, if you spent three days with Mitch and Mike and DJ, you might be a little fuzzy too. <laughs> no, we had a great time. We really did. It was, it was tremendous. And next year, uh, why don't you plan on going to a call to arms men's conference down at Rama? It was tremendous. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 28. This is when the Lord was with his disciples for the last supper. And he inaugurated, just uh, sovereignly inaugurated what we celebrate as communion, called the Lord's Supper. He changed the meaning of some of the things they did at the Passover meal. At the Passover meal, there was three loaves, and they would always break the middle one. Most of the Jews thought it represented Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they wondered, why is he breaking Isaac? When it really represented God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when he took the bread, he took the one representing himself and broke it. And changed the meaning and brought that old covenant ritual into our new covenant. And in Matthew 26, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. Well, let's just pause right there and say it now. I know some believe in transubstantiation, but as you look at John 6 and other places where Jesus refers to eating his body, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, he goes on to help you understand he means believe in him, to take by faith what he did with his body, to take for yourself by faith what he did with his blood. And that's what he means when he said, This is my body. In other words, like in John 15, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Well, he didn't just mystically or miraculously at that moment become a vine in front of them. No, he was using metaphorical language and figures of speech. And so he said, this is my body. This bread represents my body and broke it and gave it to them. Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And it just struck me this morning that Jesus did not take the bread and the wine and make mush out of it. He didn't. He didn't combine them together in a bowl. You know, when I was a kid, we had chocolate cake with chocolate frosting, vanilla ice cream. Anybody ever do that? You put them together and just chop them all up and mix them all together. We always called it goop. Boy, it was, 
You ought to love that goop, especially when the frosting was fudgy. Oh, that's another subject. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> making myself hungry. <laughs> Jesus did not just combine the bread and the wine and stir it all up and said, here, here's a spoon, go after it. Why? It's because he kept them separate because they have separate meanings and separate functions. His body was broken to bring us wholeness. The Hebrew word being shalom, perfect peace, nothing missing, nothing lacking. Everything the way it should be. Physical healing. Relational uh, reconciliation. This is my body broken for you. Because his body was broken, we can get past our fragmentation and experience the wholeness of God. And it's a process. And we're all working our way there with him. But thank God for the hope we have. We're on the journey. Amen? And then his blood. His body was broken for our wholeness. His blood was shed for our reconciliation. Colossians says that through the shedding of his blood, we have been delivered from all the power and dominion of darkness and have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son in whom we have remission of sins. Not only forgiveness of what we did, but a wiping out of the record that we ever did it. So we stand before God as though we'd never sinned, we'd never done anything wrong. And if we, if we make a bad choice, if we sin after we receive Christ, well, if we confess it, he forgives it and never remembers it again. So a believer can walk free. A believer doesn't have to spend one moment living under condemnation. Not one moment living under guilt. But by confessing it to the Lord, he forgives it and he cleanses it. The blood of Jesus, as my friend James Rushton used to say, the word of God is described as water, the water of the word. James described the blood of Jesus as the soap of the gospel. That when the word of God that communicates the power and, and effectiveness of the blood When you take that news about the blood and you communicate it through the word of God, you're putting the soap of the gospel into the word. And that's where our consciences get cleansed from all the stuff in our old life. And we're able to stand up boldly before God, boldly before others, boldly in the face of persecution or opportunity and not back down. When those thoughts come, who do you think you are? And pictures come into our mind of stuff we did. We can remember the blood. What right do you have to be here? I plead the blood. On the basis of the blood, I've got a right. Now notice something. He said in verse, verse 28 or verse 27, drink from it, all of you. So his body was broken for our wholeness. His blood was shed for our reconciliation to God and with one another. And all of us, it's for all of us. That speaks of the unity and universality for all those who believe. All of you. I mean, in Jesus' merry band of 12 disciples, he had Matthew who was a tax collector, who was looked on as a sellout, just a compromiser, and he had a zealot who had sworn to kill people like Matthew. If it wouldn't have been for Jesus, and Matthew and Simon met in the dark alley, only Simon would have walked out. But Jesus said, all of you drink of this, because in my body, in my blood, you all have unity You become one, and it's for all of you. And everyone who believes, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
We'll be delivered. We'll be healed. We'll be made whole. We'll gain hope. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you happy for the gospel? Man, that's why we want to get the message out to people. Because faith in Christ comes through hearing that message. And then people could reach out with that heart faith and simply take hold of what's freely given. It's for all of us. Would you look at one more verse here with me? It's not the last one we'll look at, but let's look at the next verse. We'll say it that way. Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans, chapter eight, verse 32. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right, church? So that whoever believes on him won't perish, but will have everlasting life. God gave his one and only son to save us. And Romans 8, 32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So think about it. His body was broken for our wholeness. His blood was shed for our reconciliation. And it's for everyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. And not only did God give Jesus for our spiritual benefit, but all the other benefits that Jesus purchased by his death and resurrection, God freely gives those with him. Freely. Freely, all things pertaining to life and godliness have been given unto you through the sacrifice of his son, and you come in to learn of them and taking hold of them. How many of us ever had money in our wallet or our purse and got in a situation where we needed to buy something and, and forgot it was there? And went through that situation, passed by that convenience store, or didn't make that purchase because we didn't have any money. When the reality was, we did too. But we weren't aware of it. We've forgotten what we had. Or we hadn't learned. Someone might have stuck a $20 bill in your wallet when you weren't looking, or your purse. You didn't realize it was there. Somebody provided it freely for you. Anybody else ever been surprised by money in your wallet? Yeah, Yeah, or in your purse. Yeah. You know, I've had angels provide us funds like that before, but most of the time it was just me or somebody I knew, and then I forgot about it. What this verse is trying to tell us is that the same God who provided your spiritual things in Christ along with him provided you everything you need for life and godliness. They're out there. They belong to you. And so that's why I've been trying to talk to you about how to receive anything. Anything. Because it's been freely given to you. Wisdom, direction, health, purpose, material things, seed to sow, bread for your food, clothing for your family, a job or a different job or resources to help other people, anything. The sacrifice of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ that we are connected with and connect with and remind ourselves of and make remembrance of by receiving communion is your guarantee that everything you'll ever need is yours. Now, it doesn't do you any good if you don't know about it. It doesn't do you or anybody else any good if you never take hold of it. If you never receive it, or if you resist it, say, no, I couldn't take that. Well, if you have trouble taking it, just just take it and quickly hand it to me. (laughs) You know, don't, don't take ownership, just let it pass on through. Because there's somebody else in the room that could use it. Amen. 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 Somebody will find something to do with it. And if they don't need it, they may just invest it and increase it. You know, if if you don't want to handle it or can't handle it, I best should say just don't want to handle it, there's plenty of people in the room who will. And they'll figure it out. And they'll do what they need to do. They have a winner's attitude. And they'll do it. They'll figure it out. They'll make it work. 
Even if they have to spin the tip on their butter knife, they'll... <laughs> and then they'll figure out how to, how to get a screwdriver from God. Amen. Amen. I mean, a lot of times, we just, a lot of times, we became willing to walk to the garage to get a screwdriver because we'd screwed up another butter knife. <laughs> you know, pain sometimes <laughs> becomes a bit better motivator. Oh, glory to God. I remember when Adam, my son, had a Fiero and was putting in a stereo years ago, and I was helping him, brilliant as I am. I was helping him, and I wonder, what happens when you put these two, these two wires together? You don't want to know what happened. I had, Adam had to get a new stereo to replace the one I just fried. You know, it, 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 there's a reason why you do a little investigation before you take action. Because sometimes your actions cause consequences that are irreversible. Now you'll see, <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Four, four steps or four points very quickly about how to receive anything. And there's a ton of stuff that I could say about all these. And, and frankly, between you and me, just humanly and personally, a ton of stuff I'd like to tell you. Because it so blessed my heart to hear it myself and have it change my life. But we don't have time for all that this morning. So let me give you these four, and we'll unpack them just a little bit. First of all, and I'll give you all four of them right off the bat. Number one, find out the will of God. I'm talking to you about how to receive anything. Number one, find out the will of God. Number two, ask for it. Number three, Look for it. Look for it. And number four, when you find it, knock. Do it. Take action. So find the will of God. Find out the will of God. Ask for it. Look for it. And when you find it, I'm going to say it again, knock. Take action. Boldly and shamelessly. Never back down. That could be a political campaign slogan. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, look with me at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Some of you are familiar with this. We've touched on especially the first two things. So let's just, I'm going to encourage you to get the messages for the last couple months, and you'll find some things about there. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 4, it came to pass as Jesus was praying in a certain place, his disciple to ask him to teach them to pray. And so he said, when you pray, say this. And this is not a prayer that we should just repeat. This is a prayer outline. First of all, acknowledge your Father in heaven and honor and glorify him. Our Father, not just God, not some impersonal spiritual force out there. Okay, this is not a dark side, light side. This is a person who loves you and cares about you, knows your needs and wants your needs to be met, and, and knows his purpose for creating you and giving you new life, knows what you're made for and where you fit, where you're going to thrive and be a blessing in this world. Hallelujah. And man, that it's his will, right, for us that we want. We don't want to be, a, I don't want to be a butter knife used as a screwdriver. Amen. You know, I, if the Lord wants some screws turned through me, I'm sure he made me a screwdriver. And so you can tell a little bit, a clue about his purpose for your life just by getting to know you and your gifts and your talents and your personality and where you thrive, what you enjoy, what's easy for you, what you're interested in, or how you'd answer the question, care looks like this. Think of it as epic. God's plan for you is epic. E, it's easy to you. P, you're passionate about it. What makes you cry? What makes your blood boil? I, I'm kind of interested in this. And C, this is what care looks like. When people are caring for somebody, this is what it looks like. 
Maybe it's giving them money. Maybe it's teaching them something. Maybe it's supplying a material good or lifting a burden off of them. See, that's gifts of giving, gifts of showing mercy. But when you get to know you, you get a clue about your purpose in the Lord. It's epic. Can you say it's epic? So you want to find out the will of God. He said, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, give, is he's asking. Can we agree on that? But asking is number two. Don't jump over number one and try to do number, and do number two and then live your life wondering, well, why didn't that work? It's but you, you, skipped, you skipped step one. So first of all, you have to find out the will of God. The asking came after the affirmation and focus on his will. Now, you can't, the, let me just say it this way. The will of God is knowable. His will for your life is knowable. But it's not knowable by looking at other lives or looking at other people around you and saying, well, this happened, so this must have been the will of God. No, I can tell you, not all that happens in life, and this is a major doctrinal point about the sovereignty of God. Yes, God is sovereign. He is supreme. But the way he administers his kingdom among us is not by treating the world and us like marionettes, It's not. You can't look around the world and say, well, that happened, so it was God's will. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, he said, Behold, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he tells us what to choose. Choose life. But this world is screwed up because people are not doing that. They're lying. They're cheating. They're stealing. They're selfish. They're greedy. Welcome to the human race. Thank God for his deliverance through Christ and a new birth. Amen? Amen. You can't say honestly that everything you've ever done in life was the will of God. You can't say it. How many of you would, okay, let's just be vulnerable. We're not going to ask for specifics. But how many of you could raise your hand and say, I have done things knowingly contrary to God's will in my life? See, people looking on say, well, that must have been God's will because look at what Lauren did. Must have been God's leading. No. Not everything. And you can't know your, God's will for your life. How do you know it? It's knowable. Come to the Word of God. Amen. Come to a sure You can't even know God's will in your life because somebody prophesied it to you. People have been messed up. Well, God, thus saith the Lord, you should marry her. One, one guy was in seminary preparing to be a pastor. And in that particular denomination, every pastor's wife needed to sing, led the junior choir, played the piano during praise and worship. So he was deeply in love. He'd seen this girl from the first day of school. Man, he, man, they clicked. She liked him. He liked her. You can imagine all the little notes and the hearts floating and all. But then he realized she couldn't sing. So, he said, well, that's it. I'm sorry. I just, we, we, so, he said, well, I need to find somebody who can sing. So, there was this other girl in class. Frankly, she was a little bit not as beautiful. Not as, you know, she just wasn't. <laughs> and, but she could sing beautifully. So, he got to know her. He proposed, and they got married. You understand that took longer to develop than it just was to tell about it. But, and on the day after their wedding, have a night together, he rolled over in the morning. There she is laying in the bed. He rolls over and looks at her and says, Sing, honey, sing. <laughs> you, okay, bad joke, but... <laughs> You can't, you can't tell the will of God just because of something happening in somebody's life. Amen. Amen. 
But number one is to find the will of God. Ephesians 5.17, the Amplified Classic Version says, Therefore do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. And what difference does it make? Look at 1 John chapter 5. You may want to underline or highlight, memorize, commit to heart this truth and these verses. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. What difference does it make? We're talking to you about how to receive anything. Find out, find out what the will of God is for you. Before you go to pray, what difference does that make? Well, look at verse John, 1 John 5, 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions we have asked of Him. When you have done your homework right off the bat and, and have settled, this is God's will for me, then you're, you're now in a position to ask Him for it. And when you ask Him for it, you can ask Him with full confidence that He's hearing your request and granting it the moment you ask Him. Now, it's going to take a little while sometimes for him to get it to you, okay? If you're asking for the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues, you can get that right now. You know, healing, you can get that right now. A lot of times, sometimes they're healed as they went or it's progressive, but you can lay hold of that right now. But guys, young single guys, if you're asking for a wife... Uh, she may not be sitting in your car right, waiting to ride home shotgun with you when you get out of church. It may take a little while for that prayer to get answered. But don't give up. But neither pray, that, neither pray for a wife before asking God if it's His will for you to have one. How many of you married folks that say it's better to be single than married wrong? Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. You'd be better off. Life would be better. Uh, just you and Jesus and being social with other people, then, then commit your life to somebody and, and man, it'd, it'd be tough. God wants us to get married and spend a life together, but he doesn't want it to be a life sentence. Amen. It's a, blessed is the man. He that finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. And obtains favor of the Lord. But did you hear that? He that finds a wife finds. Okay, step number one, determine the will of God for your life. Not, not just asking God, what school should I go to? But God, should I go to school? Do you want me to get a four-year degree or a trade school or just sign up for an apprenticeship? God, what's your, what's your plan for my life? You determine that first, and then you ask him, and he'll help you. So, okay, John fifteen seven, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You'll ask what you will, and it'll be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, verse 8, that you bear much fruit. That's answered prayer. We should be, our life should be like a picture of Santa Claus with a gift full of, a bag, a bag full of gifts on our back. We should be going through life carrying a load of answered prayers. Because that's how God gets, God doesn't get any glory out of you, your prayers, my prayers, never being answered us doing without. He never gets glory out of that. He gets glory out of the fact he's a good, good father. I asked him, he said he'd take care of me. Yeah. Glory to God. I asked him, and I've proved him faithful. He's faithful. We sang about that. Amen? Yeah. Oh, glory to God. So, if you let his word abide in you, how are you going to do that? You're going to hear from him. You're going to love him and his word and listen when he talks. Cherish it on the inside of your heart. Know what his will is through that. And then ask him and live according to his will. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So, so we've kind of said this. Number one is understand the will of God. Number two is ask. Ask. Well, pastor, you've said that 18 times already. Well, listen, James chapter 4 verse 2 clearly says, you do not have because you do not ask. That kind of smarts. To think that God has provided us everything we need for life and godliness. And the only reason that we don't have it and are enjoy it or be able to bless others with it is because we never ask for it. Amen. And some of us will go to our graves. People will go to their graves doing without 
God's provision for their life when they could have had it. Life could have been different. They could have lived different, could have been different, could have worn different. Amen? Given different. Because he gives seed to the sower and bread for food. Listen, in Matthew chapter 6, we looked at this. In Matthew chapter 6, where Matthew recorded the same things, Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites praying out in public so, so you get kudos from everybody else and they think you're something. Go into your closet and pray to your father who sees in secret. And he'll reward you openly. When you pray, don't use a bunch of vain repetitions and say the same thing over and over and over again, thinking that God's going to hear you just because you're saying it again and again. Listen, if you haven't done your step one, and you're asking again and again and again and again for something that you don't know, you're not convinced of it being God's will, so you're not in faith, you're not asking it for it in faith, you're not asking for it in confidence, you're wasting your breath. You don't even know if he's here hearing the prayer. But if you found out it is his will, then when you ask, you're not twisting his arm. You're simply coming him using the processes he's established for you to put in a requisition to receive his goods. Amen. That's all. That's, good That's all. The, the word ask is that way. In the Spirit Filled Life Stutter Bible, in Matthew chapter 7, on verse 7, ask, listen to this scholarly note. The word ask means to request or petition. The word usually describes a suppliant making request of someone in higher position, such as an individual asking something from God, a subject from a king, a child from a parent, or a beggar from a person of substance. Listen to this. The word, you remember when Peter and John were going in the tent beautiful and that lame person asking alms of them? This is this word ask where he said ask. So we're asking. Listen to the the, really the simplicity of this, the, the, really the logic, the, the, the lack of emotion in this. It's, it's, he's, the scholar says the word, the Greek word translated ask, denotes insistent asking without qualms, not commanding God, but solidly presenting a requisition whose items he longs to distribute. You're simply presenting a requisition to someone, to God your Father, whose items he longs to distribute. And yet, in Matt, going back over to Matthew 6, he said, Don't be like those that use all those repetitions, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And yet he says, ask. Yeah. Why? That's the, how the transaction takes place. That's the process. We had a tool crib when I worked at, at the Bible school. And each one of us had several wooden buttons with our number on it. Now, the leaders of the ministry had provided all those tools. And those were there for our use so we could accomplish the purpose for, that they were paying us for. Then we needed something from the tool crib. We just walked up to the window, told the person in the tool crib, I want this. And they would take that. Here's what they were supposed to do. Some of them were yahoos and made it hard. They're supposed to just hand you the tool and put your button on the peg. Some of them just wanted to jerk your chain a little bit, you know, have an ego trip, puff themselves up over you. And I finally had the attitude, well, you can do whatever you want to. And at the end of the day, I'm either going to be standing right here waiting on it, or I'm walking away with it. You decide. Because I'm supposed to be here. These things are provided for me. They're not based upon my quality, my ability, my name, my heritage, nothing. They've been totally paid for and provided and purposed for my use. So I'm walking up here without any kind of qualms. The word qualms is a word that, that I know, how many of you use qualms this week? Probably nobody. Let me share the definition of qualms with you because it, it means an uneasy feeling of doubt, worry, or fear, especially about one's own conduct or misgiving. Like military regimes have no qualms about controlling the media. 
They have no misgivings about it. They're not uneasy about it. They're not in fear about it. And Jesus said, your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. So don't think you've got to say it again and again. Just know his will, his word in you, and you come without any doubt, any worry, any need to qualify yourself, and just put in your requisition to someone whose items he longs to distribute. He's there, there for you. He's waiting for you to come. All you got to do is find out what belongs to you, what his will is for your life, and be convinced of it yourself enough to do step three, seek. Seek. The moment that you have prayed and asked, now let me, let me preface this. Some of you are familiar with the verse in Matthew 18, verse 19, where Jesus said, whatever two or three of you agree on earth as touching, whatever two or three of you ask, Oh, and in fact, go over to Matthew 18. You guys need to, to catch this. Matthew 18, verse 19, Jesus said, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they, what's the next word? Ask. It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Parents, friends, church members can pray that prayer of agreement. But I want you to notice something. If you don't ask, you're not doing this verse. And so many times people will come and say, would you agree with me on this? Come up, you know, I've got this sickness going on. I believe I'm healed. Would you agree with me? Okay, I'll agree with you. And then they hang up. I haven't prayed with them. You're thinking, aren't you? Beware starting out your prayers with thank you for this, thank you for that, thank you for the other thing. You need to ask yourself, have I asked for that? Have I taken the time to talk with my father who loves me and provides for me and actually ask him for that? Or am I just flipping off a thank you here and thank you there and thank you for the other thing? And, and yeah, I agree with you on that. But we haven't even prayed. Jesus tells us this is a prayer of agreement, and it's incredibly powerful. Amen. So number one is find out the will of God. Number two is ask. Number three is seek. Here in Luke, he said, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. And a lot of people, and I'm going to have to quicken this up. A lot of people, they, they find the will of God. They pray, and then they just sit and wait for it to come. And that's why they do without. Yep. Well, God, I see from your word you want me to be married. And I see from your word that it's my role as the man to find a wife. Yeah. Not to sit here and wait for you to bring her to me. Amen. But I, it's my, are you with me? Yeah. To find her, to seek. To seek. Years ago, we, as a church, decided we needed a church van. We prayed. It was the will of God. We prayed, believe by faith we received that church van. You with me so far? Then we sat here for six months waiting for it to materialize in the driveway. No, we didn't. We found out who sells vans. We found out every way we could. Where's some vans that are available? I remember we were going down to Galesburg, Illinois to get some supplies, and on the way back, we had heard that there were two vans, like we were looking for, available at a dealer in, in the Quad Cities. And I remember pulling, as we approached, stopping there, I said, Lord, I really don't care if, if either one of these are our van, but I want to know. I just want to know about these. You know, I pulled in, the two vans were sitting there. As soon as we parked, I looked at one, and that's not it. I got out and went and sat in the seat, and the other one, I had no sooner sat in the seat and looked over at the radio and looked around for about 10 seconds, and now this is not it. Within 60 seconds, I knew. What was I doing? I was seeking. I was seeking. We ended up getting a real nice GMC van, real sporty looking red and silver van. It was really cool at that time. I was seeking. Ask and you'll receive. Seek. And you find, well, Christ delivered me from poverty. 
Father, I ask you to give me the prosperity that became mine the moment I accepted Jesus. Thank you for his blood shed for me, his body broken for me. Thank you for providing my every need. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Then you get up and go look for it. All the time looking to the Lord, what step do I take? Well, I think it just seems like, you know, I'm kind of interested in rental property. They're doing this, and they're doing this, and they're doing this. They're making good money. And, and then suddenly, as you take a couple steps, you realize, yeah, but it's a job for them. I've already got a job. God's not, what's in my heart is not to take on another full-time job. You know, at my age, I could go down and take care of toilets. I could do all that stuff. I could flip a property. I could do that stuff. But it's not really in my heart to do it. Nothing wrong with it. But, Lord, that just doesn't seem to be a fit for me. I think investing, putting, like my dad used to say, Lauren, he said, you got to get past the point where you're working for money and get your money working for you. Amen. You know, it seems like what the Lord's doing for us, you know, we got plenty to do. We don't need another job, but we need to put something to work for us. Amen. And look into the Lord all the time, seeking opportunities. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Then... Fourthly, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock, and it'll be open to you. For every, that's step four, knock. For everyone that asks, receives. Everyone that seeks, finds. And he that knocks, it's open to him. Would you look back over to Luke 11 with me? In the midst of this teaching on, on how to receive anything, Jesus tells us this story verse 5 and he said to them which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him friend lend me three loaves do you see that it's at midnight for a friend of mine has come to me on this journey and I have nothing to set before him and he will answer from within and say don't trouble me the door is shut my children are with me they're in bed I'm not getting up shut up go home it's not my fault poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part hey Joe I know you're in there I hear you breathing hey It is a good day to give thanks unto the Lord. Hey! Now, he's not talking here primarily about the attitude of the guy inside. And he's not saying anything that this is God's attitude where he's a stingy guy and he hates you coming. We already saw from his scriptures that that's not him, right? What Jesus is illustrating is not anything about the attitude. Don't don't adopt the attitude of the guy indoors. Adopt the guy attitude of the guy on the outside. What do you want? Well, it's like I told you. I had this friend come. I don't have a thing. The freezer's empty. All the deer meat's gone. We ate it all up. I don't have anything. I tell you, if because the guy sticks with it long enough, because he knocks long enough, because he doesn't give up, he receives. Amen. Now, a lot of people, a lot of believers, they ask, they, they know the will of God, they ask, and they seek, and the first little bit of opposition they run into, then they want to be nice. And they're so nice. Or they're so humble, even with fake humility, they don't want to bother anybody, don't want to put anybody else. God has led them to this person's door. God has led them to this opportunity, to this door of opportunity. God has said, That's your place. You've been asked, you asked, you received, you sought it. This is it. You found out that this is the equipment that you need. You've asked me about it. You've clarified my will. You found out what you're needing, what you're wanting. This is it. Now they say they can't sell it to you. (laughs) 
That's going to change. And I'm not going home. I'm not leaving the tool crib without the tool. God's part is to supply. My part is to be shamelessly persistent. Shamelessly persistent. Let me read you this verse in some other translations. Before I do, let me just, years ago, before we owned this building, I looked back at our board meeting minutes one day, and it said just a little entry, said, Pastor Lauren, talk to Sense again about buying the building, and they said no. That just so struck me, because Sense next door owned the building, and that said I'd talk to them again about buying the building, and they said no. And friends, they said no for years. This church has been this building since 1983. They said no for years. They had golf carts stored in a warehouse back here. They were using it. They wouldn't sell it. Then, then along the way, some things lined up. We got about $100,000 saved up on a building fund. Then somebody sold some stock and approached me to see if the church would receive stock. And, and it just came out of my heart to ask them again. So I asked one of the elder brothers over, and we sat in a room. And I said, would it be all right if we pray before I start? He said, yeah, yeah. They were Catholic fellows. I said, yeah. So I prayed. said, Lord, let your will be done. Help us communicate carefully. Let, this, let your will be done. And so, amen. And I just looked at him and said, well, we'd like to buy your building. His next words, after thinking for about 10 seconds, were, I don't see any problem with that. We're living in a house that the people did not want to sell to us. They were, they were selling it for sale by owner. We were working through a realtor. We looked at it. We turned it down at first. We countered, then we countered or something like that. And, 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 but he didn't want to sell it using a realtor because they had to pay our commissions. And I got a call here at the office, and we were talking to the realtor, and they, they had quoted us a price and said, no, we, we're not going to do that. I just, we walked away. It wasn't a strategy. It just seemed like, well, no, we're just not going to do that. A couple days later, we got a call and said, they've accepted your counteroffer. And at that point, we'd already decided we weren't buying it. So I came into Joy's office. I said, this is, told her what had happened. They want to know what, if we, you know, if they get accepted our counteroffer. She said, I don't know, it's just up to you. So I walked back in the office, and I was, I was starting to pray, and I said, Lord, I just need to know what to do here, because if, 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 if I was going to say it right now, if I would answer them right now, I would say, and I was fully prepared to have the word no come out my mouth. And before I could get no out of my mouth, just up out of my heart, came a strong yes. Amen. And that house has gone up $100,000 in value in the five years that we've owned it. Amen. The reason I say that, because I know $100,000 to some of you is, is nothing, or very little. $100,000 to some of you is like Disneyland stuff. I've been there too. I've been there at the days when I recognized that if, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. And what 28% interest was on a credit card maxed out and paying the minimum payments and how long this was going to take and decided to live within our means, start using in, zero interest rate credit cards and rolling stuff over and beginning to get out. The blessing of God come upon you as you seek and you find and then you knock we're the best place financially that we've ever been in our life. I'm not going to tell you what we're worth because some of you think, eh. Some of you think, wow. I look and I think, wow. <laughs> not too bad. From a farm boy from a rural southern Iowa with the little white house out behind the big white house. It's the blessing of the Lord. Seek the Lord, you as saints. There is no want to them that seek Him. 
Don't be passive. Don't give up. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We could have given up on the house. We could have given up on a lot of stuff. We could have given up on the building. And if we'd have, done, if we'd have given up, we'd have done without. Sure is quiet in here. How to receive anything that the blood of Jesus has already provided for you. That God wants you, your Father wants you to have. Find out what His will is. Ask Him for it. Believe you receive it right then. Then seek it. Seek it. It's, not, it's going to be individual for you. And when you find it, when, he, when you, he brings you right up to that door, don't back down from it. This is God's will. This is my territory. Ownership just changed hands. God Almighty said, this is mine now. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're not going to pay for it or you expect everybody to give you something or don't be presumptuous or rude. And it might cost you, it might have a higher price than you're willing to pay. I mean, we're looking for a house. We finally, I finally realized to find the house that's in our heart to have, we're going to have to go up and pay more. But God will provide it. Come on, church. Don't leave me hanging out here. God, can I get a witness from somebody? God will provide it. He'll provide it. How we find out what the will of the Lord is, ask him for it. He'll hear your prayer and he'll grant it right then. And then look for it. Look for it knowing it's there. And knowing he'll help you find it. And when you find it, you'll know it on the inside. Hallelujah. And then don't back down just because something gets in the way or looks like it's not going to happen. That's just the devil. And he's already defeated by the blood of Jesus. Amen, church. Amen. Hallelujah. And so let's receive even more than we ever have before so we can be a greater blessing than we've ever been. Praise the Lord. Let's receive communion. That's what fell. Thank you. Would you grab your communion elements? Hallelujah. Go ahead and get the the bread out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes on him won't perish but will have everlasting life. And you've heard of all her good things that he has for you. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead three days later. He died because of our sins to take care of him. He was raised from the dead because he had him taken care of. And he's alive and he's Lord. And if you will believe that in your heart and acknowledge that with your mouth, making Him Lord in your life, these things that I've been talking about, the benefits will begin to flow towards you and into your life. And I promise you a year from now, I'll just say it this way, you receive Jesus today and you give me a year, I'll change your life. You'll be different. Your life will be different. Now, don't play games with it and say, I'll give you... I gave you a year, one Sunday a quarter. No, I'm talking about being in church, being in a group, hanging out with the guys if you're a guy, and girls if you're a girl, and all those sorts of things. But believers, can I get a, a witness to help me out here? You'd recommend people that don't know the Lord to receive him. Could you raise your hand up and wave him around? All right, every head every bowed, please, every eye closed. If you'd say to me, Pastor Lauren, I believe what you said about Jesus. And right now today, I'm, I'm giving him my life. Jesus, you're my Lord now. If I'm talking to you, on the count of three, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Go ahead and lift your hands. Jesus is becoming my Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all pray this together. Say it with me. Dear God in heaven, thank you for Jesus. And Jesus, I receive you as my Lord. Here's my life, Lord. Make me new. And thank you for helping me live for you. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Can we rejoice, church? Hallelujah. At least two people raise their hand online, celebrate. Hallelujah. Let us know. Now, if you, I've got some things I want to put in your hand uh, to help you get started. The ushers have them, and they want to give them to you for me. If you raised your hand to receive the Lord, would you lift that hand one more time so they could come to you and bring you that gift for me? Guys, come on down here. Hallelujah. If you would go ahead and lift your hand. All right. Well, I'm not going to force the issue. All right. Grab your communion elements and say it with me. This bread represents Jesus' body broken for me. So I receive my wholeness in every way. Thank you, Lord. Let's break and eat the bread. Go ahead and peel back the cover. Say it with me. This cup is Jesus' blood. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me to yourself and helping me to stay one with others. Amen. Let's receive the cup. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a couple things that I would like you to do. Hit the subscribe button, rate, and review the podcast. And if you'd like to invest in helping us reach more people for Christ, head over to mywordoflife.church and click the online giving button. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.